All right. Thank you, Lisa and John, for sharing your time um, and your knowledge with us today. Um, I certainly appreciate the two unique types of information you shared. And um, I think it's clear that a significant amount of time and money is going into research and educational efforts um, to better understand everyone's role in controlling transmission of this virus. And um, I think it was interesting to hear how many manure applicators um, reported that they're adjusting their practices to minimize their opportunity for spreading PEDV. And so starting uh, with the first one that I saw posted, uh, Charles Gould has asked, uh, will mesophilic temperatures in an anaerobic digester kill the PEDV organism? And um, I'll probably let Lisa answer this question if she has any comments. Um, my take on it, I don't believe there's been any research reported on, um, on virus um, viability in digesters. Um, mesophilic temperatures were usually looking, um, I guess, in about 70 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I would say uh, my, my opinion would be that, that we're probably not reaching high enough temperatures, um, you know, given some of the data showing that we needed to hit 160 degrees for, you know, at least 10 minutes. But then, you know, that moderately high temperature for a much longer time period may, in fact, um, be enough to, to destroy the organism. But Lisa, do you have any comments on that question? Uh, thanks, Amy. Actually, <laughs> your response would be mine because uh, we, I do not know of any research currently and we have not done any currently to address that question specifically. All we've done is just basic in-lab survivability. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, going down the list, Eric Hurley asks, uh, what are the risks of transmission from manured fields? How long is the virus viable in a field condition? Um, again, I think we've established that maybe we don't have that data yet and that's something that um, needs to be looked at. Um, John or Lisa, do you have any, any other comments on that question? Uh, other than I agree completely. I've got my notes written down to look at that. Okay. Yes, and I would certainly agree, uh, Amy and Lisa, that that is a priority. Uh, we are hoping to do some work on that in Manitoba, um, but we'll have to see uh, if we can get that project uh, uh, approved and going. Okay, thank you both. Um, Brittany asks, what is known in regards to PEDV being shed in reproductive material? I think that would be a question for you, Lisa. Sure. Um, we have not specifically focused on, on that in reproductive material only because this appears to be an enteric disease and not a reproductive disease. Plus, it gets relatively difficult to ferret that out because sometimes if an animal does experience an abortion um, and there is a lot of PED in the environment, it becomes very difficult to determine what was the origination of that virus. And so I, the, probably the easiest answer is that we don't know from a reproductive side, um, but the, it is not a reproductive disease. Uh, reproductive effects are more of a side effect of the disease itself. Okay. Um, Carl Dupont has a question for John. You mentioned um, some checklists that um, you think are a good idea to use when um, custom manure applicators are working with producers. Uh, do you have a link to those checklists? Um, I, I don't have a, I'm not sure I have a checklist exactly in the way you're thinking of it, Charles, but what I would say is that a good starting point is, in fact, the uh, protocols that National Pork Board has put out for commercial manure applicators because there are about 20 or 25 individual items here that would be, I think, a good start. And and if I had a manure application firm, that's probably where I would start. And then I would likely build on it and say, okay, well, if it's a sow farm, what are the, the risks compared to a grow finish barn? Are there some separate things that our firm wants to do? Um, what do our clients want? And so it would evolve. But I think this protocol would be an excellent start starting place for any firm to build a checklist. and. Uh, as I mentioned on the call, I'm a huge fan of checklists because uh, it, it, it helps remind people of every last thing that should be done. And, uh, and if they sign off, um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, there's a better chance that they're going to have done it uh, if they sign their name to something. Great. Thank you, John. 
A couple more questions from Carl. Uh, you indicate that there were no um, evidences of the virus in manure spreading operations. Are there any rules of thumb we can use um, regarding manured fields? Uh, when when we say rules of thumb um, regarding manure fields, uh, I'm not sure I'm quite following that. That's a full thought there. Yeah, I um, I think you know I think in response to this question, we don't really know. Um, how long the virus remains viable in manure once it's applied to fields, so I'm not sure we can really offer any um, best management practice or rules of thumb related to um, managing manure once it's land applied. Um, like what, what I can say, Amy, is uh, like we know that it doesn't do well in heat, and I think as has been mentioned earlier before, uh, UV rays, sunshine uh, will certainly um, uh, kill the virus. Uh, and so there is some information known about this, but not to the extent that we could, uh, you know, define it with timelines or lengths of time or exact temperatures in a field, that sort of knowledge. But we, we do know that certainly if it's in the sunlight, if it's in warmer temperatures, that the virus will last, if it's dry, particularly if it's dry, that the virus will not live as long as if it's in wet, cold conditions. Great, right, thanks. I agree with that, John. Um, one additional question here from Carl. Um, are there any precautions for residents in close proximity to hog farms that may be infected? Um, I'll let Lisa comment on this, but my initial response would be that this is not a, um, a disease that's of concern to humans. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, as far as um, human risk, whether, you know, they're aren't really any precautions for residents that live near farms, but Lisa, maybe you would want to comment on that further. Sure. Um, no, that's exactly right. It, it isn't a human, uh, a human infection. It's just an infection of pigs. Now, if you're concerned if you have hogs at your site and you're next door to a site that's positive, um, then the focus is really on uh, making sure that you minimize crossover as much as possible. Um, you know, whether that's you know, really maintaining and, and limiting who comes in and out of the farm, making sure that you work with other vendors. If you have, say, a feed truck come in or a propane truck, um, working with those folks to establish some, some basic protocols of how they work at your farm. And really other things, we try to keep it simple and, and focus on that line of separation. So whatever is on the outside, you could assume that could be at risk versus what's on the inside of your farm. And so do some basic things like changing your footwear and even putting on some clean coveralls before going into a barn so you're not carrying something inside. And that's a lot of the things that we focused on in some of the procedures and protocols for PED. All right, thank you. A uh, question here from Terry Conger. Um, what do you think is the greatest risk of PEDV over long distances, um, such as into a clean state? and what precautions should be implemented. Um, so Lisa, I think this would be um, a question you could answer regarding the transportation. Um, sure. Right. You know, right now there are currently no uh, restrictions, movements between states. Now some states have asked that if you are moving pigs into different states that you declare that on your, your health certificate. But some other things that people can do is as much as possible is to, you know, look at trailer sanitation. Um, to make sure that their equipment is clean. Um, if you are moving pigs, even with your animal movement guidelines and, and downtime for drivers, um, try to minimize your stops. You know, if you see that there's other pig trucks nearby, don't park near them. Try to park away from them. Um, you know, if you do identify animals that are sick, get with your veterinarian right away to try to get diagnosis. Um, and, and just be aware if there's high traffic areas that other trucks are moving on, um, it, if at all possible, find a potential alternate route. Some of those things are, are things that we've done not only for PED, but for other diseases like PERS. All right, and the question that follows that is, is really related to what you just explained. Um, but Carl asks again, um, any thoughts on disinfect, disinfecting trucks leaving suspected hog farms? and and I know we've, you discussed that in your presentation, Lisa, and then just a little bit um, in that previous question. Is there anything else you want to add 
um, as far as disinfection. Yeah, you know, it is hard with with trying to clean and disinfect a truck on farm if you don't especially have a wash facility. Um, You know, the big thing is really trying to contain uh, things in the farm as much as possible. I mean, we've got to move animals, and there's going to be a time where we have to drive to a truck wash. Um, But I think, again, trying to, you know, not not park near other animals or farms with it if you have a truck that has yet to be washed and disinfected. There's also was research, that very same research, looked at if you hold a trailer for seven days at room temperature, that will also kill the virus. Um, and so if you move pigs, it's one of the options, if you're moving especially within your own farm or within uh, several farms that you know of, you may just let the truck sit before you use it again or before you even wash it. Um, all of those things just you have to take into consideration um, when you look at your risks of movement or moving the virus around. All right, great. Um, the next question here is from Eric Hurley, um, and I think it relates to um, the discussion about the mandatory reporting. Um, he asked, based on past infectious diseases, what percent of farms... Um, Sorry, my page just skipped up. What percent of farms will post their farm is infected with PEDV or be willing to tell a service provider that um, they are infected? Huh. That, you know, that's a really good question. I do know, at least, again, from June 5th moving forward, that if there are farms that are positive with PED, they will have to be reported to USDA. Um, now, obviously, that, that doesn't mean that folks have to report to other people, but I think there is a greater awareness and a greater willingness to cooperate with people. Um, I look at our experience with the PERS virus, it's porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, and there's been a lot of projects that are going on for regional elimination of that virus, and so it's I think it's really stepped up communication between producers, between other service providers, and just increased the willingness of people to share their disease status. Um, Obviously, people are, you know, nervous about, you know, having their businesses changed or shut down or not being able to do what they need to do on a daily basis. But I think our experience is that none of that has happened, um, you know, and people are becoming more willing to share information so they can protect themselves and also protect their neighbors. All right. Um, Carl makes a good point here. Um, I think that when applying manure, we need to consider the following. No spreading on frozen ground. Be vigilant of prevailing winds. Consider vegetative buffer areas around manure spreading areas, et cetera. And says, do you agree? And I think those are good points, Carl. Um, You know, we're where most states would not allow spreading on frozen ground anyway, but, um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of producers, the practice is to apply manure in the fall once crops are out, and um, as temperatures start to drop, then we know that the virus um, survives better in cold temperatures, so um, I think your points are good there, um, and hopefully we'll be seeing some research conducted over the next um, several months that will maybe reveal some other management practices that can control um, the viability of that virus in um, on manure amended soils. Yeah, and the other comment I'd offer, Amy, is uh, you know it seems to me that the the method of manure application could affect uh, uh, the appropriateness of some of these strategies because if the manure is incorporated and injected into the soil, of course there's a different risk profile than if it's broadcast, and so. Um, I, I applaud uh, Charles' thought there on, uh, um, uh, sorry, it's Carl, uh, uh, rethinking how we're doing things in light of this risk. Um, and it is, a, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of factors that come into it. Very good points, John. Thank you. Um, Kevin Schultz asks, any idea how long the virus can live on community surfaces such as convenience store floors? Um, that drivers need to be concerned about even if another livestock trailer isn't present at the time. Lisa, is that something you are able to comment on? Um, Yes. You know, we have not done studies specifically in community areas like that, although we do know there is some survivability of the virus in general. However, that question does highlight the need as we look at even line of separation and providing barriers. And 
even potentially having the virus in outside areas like a convenience store, like a grocery store, whatever, it just brings home the need to, if you go into a farm or go into another area that you know does not have the virus, is to be able to have some kind of barrier or break of your equipment. So again, we kind of go back to the protocol of don't wear the same clothing or at least footwear that you do out in the community, out around town that you wear directly into a farm or into an animal area. Um, or that could even apply to a farm if you're doing manure application or wear something like foot covers to prevent, you know, in, infection or contamination of your shoes and footwear. But it's just trying to understand that there is a risk out in the community versus how you don't want to bring that risk back to the farm and taking some, some basic steps to do that. So um, I think this brings us to the end of our um, webcast today. I appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, and thank you for all of the great questions you submitted to our presenters. Um, once again, I want to thank Dr. Becton and Mr. Carney for um, sharing their expertise with us today. Um, I appreciate um, everyone um, sharing this information in, in your states with your producers and with your custom manure applicators. And um, as we move forward, I'm sure there will be additional research um, results that um, the National Pork Board will share with us um, that cover some of the questions that we were asked today.